Amen. Our soul magnifies the Lord. What a glorious thing he has done to take on flesh just like ours, to live as we live, to be tempted as we were tempted, yet be without sin, so that he might share sinlessness with us and clear us, totally wash us clean of all that we had done in sin. Grateful for his mighty works and his victory that is ours by faith in him. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 6 today. We're in the midst of 40 days of renewal. If you're new to Meadowbrook, you can jump right in. There's some information at the exits. Uh, today, you can just pick up one of the resource guides for 40 days and just connect with us as we're continuing to seek renewal in our lives. Renewal of spirit, renewal of body and relationships and a lot of different ways that we're renewing ourselves unto the Lord. And you can start. Maybe some of you had a little hiccup over the last few days. Maybe you didn't follow through with everything that you were intending to follow through. I would just say pick back up right now. You can just jump right back in. Uh, this one life group class last week, the word got to me that they were having some dialogue about uh, some of the, the things that they were trying to establish in their life. And some of that was a partial fast, what we're calling the Daniel fast. Uh, that we've done for a couple of years now and, and one particular person said that it, she had failed in following the Daniel fast so it's over with and, and her life group encouraged her hey if you dropped your phone and cracked your screen would you throw your, your whole phone away now you keep on using your phone even though it's a little bit broken uh, I would say that that's a good illustration for us there are going to be some times that we're going to stumble and we're going to have some mishaps and we're going to say oh man I, I messed it up I might as well just put it down Oh, no, 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 just, just go right back into it and see how God will use it in your life and encourage you, build up some discipline in you and move you to a greater sense of the presence of God in your life. Just encourage you wherever you are in the midst of this to jump back in. You're a little bit behind on your daily reading. Don't try to catch back up. Start with today's reading. And maybe if the Lord gives you some additional time and the heart to do it, you'll circle back and pick those up. If not, Hey, th we're, I hung up my tassels as a Pharisee a long time ago, all right? So we'll just live in the grace of God. We'll, we'll do it what He allows us to do in the way that He allows us to do it, and, and as we're learning discipline. All right, so uh, Romans chapter 6, I want to begin in verse 11, because this is a great passage for us to discover some ways that you and I might have victory over sin. So here they go. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of unrighteousness. Or for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Is there anybody here today that would like to have less sin in your life? Anybody? Which ones, namely? Uh, just kidding. You don't have to tell me that. Uh, James does say, confess your sins to one another and you'll be healed. Uh, but we won't do that this morning necessarily as a, as a public way of responding. Hey, there's some things in my life that I really believe that God wants me to put down. Some things in my flesh that he just doesn't want me to participate with, some ideas, some attitudes, some words, some actions that I just want to forego. In fact, I'll tell you, when I was in my later 40s, moving towards 50, I thought, Lord, I do not want to carry these things into the latter century of my life. I'm still carrying some of those, but that's the reason why we have 40 days of renewal, to, to come back to those places where we're surrendering the things of the flesh to the things of the Holy Spirit. That's what, what the renewal period is about for many of us. So I've determined those things and those things that I really want to see God help me to have transformation in, those, those things that I want freedom from. And you're probably there as well. I'm doing some serious soul searching and some intense prayer times during the midst of the 40 days. And I'm purposeful to discipline my thoughts and my words and my actions so that I can build up new rhythms, new patterns, and new ways of thinking, and that God would be honored in that. And I'm a, I'm a whole lot better to be around when, when I'm in, engaged in the things of Christ in that way. 
So hopefully you and your family have joined us in 40 days. If not, you can jump right in and get stirred up in the midst, midst of it all. And if you faltered, I'd say just circle back around and see where God wants you to pick up where you left off. There's not a single person here today that does not struggle with sin. Every one of us struggles with sin. The Bible is clear about that, that there is not a single person without sin. Right? You are not going to be sinless. But the Bible is just as clear that you can sin less. And that's what I want. He is making me to be sinless. And one day I'll experience that in his glory. But until that day, it's my purpose to be sinning less. Join me in that. Join me because as we get engaged in this life of righteousness with him, there is greater joy. There's greater blessings. It's just a greater hope. I'm recognizing that uh, all of us can live in that way. Now, this started the moment you trusted in Jesus as your Savior. If you've yet to do that, then this could be the day for that. That God gives you an understanding that the way of righteousness is Christ. That God gives you an understanding the way out of your sin is Christ. And the reason why it's essential that you have the way out of your sin is because you are going to face him in his holiness one day. And he's going to bear to count everything that has ever been done in this body. And we want to be named sinless. And Jesus is the one who does that. So come to this place of meaning uh, where your heartfelt life is given to Jesus in faith that you might be rescued from sin and might be free from that. So now if you believe the lie that you can't be freed from sin, then you need to settle down in this truth. If, you, if you're thinking that sin is always going to have its power over you, then you need to settle into the truth because it's good news that God gives to us today. If your life is in Jesus Christ, by the declaration of God, you already have victory over your sin. You already have victory in that in your life. You may not have appropriated that victory yet. You may not be exercising the portions that God has given you to have total victory and transformation in your life, but it has already begun. That work of God has already begun. And here's what he says. He who has started it is faithful to complete it all the way to the end. So I'm trusting him for that, and I want you to join me in trusting him in that. There's a real popular verse in the second letter that was written to the church at Corinth, and Paul says this in the fifth chapter, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, you're probably familiar with that if you're a student of the Bible have been around uh, Meadowbrook very long I just want to concentrate on that last part sure we are in Christ we are a new creation in Christ the old us has passed away I want you to focus in on that last part that I've underlined there the new has come the reason why I want you to focus on that is because it's a it's a very important verb that which is translated has come is a very important verb in the original language and the tense of it is important it gives us some significance uh, in our understanding of the original language of the Bible, it means that there is a progression to the action. The new has come, and it keeps on benefiting you. The new has come, and you can live in the power of that newness of life because it continues to be new in you. There's a real emphasis in that. It has been completed in Christ. That's what he was doing on the cross. He was complete, completing the victory, this new life that is ours. In the resurrection, he shares that new life with us. It has already come, but the continual effect of that is still being realized. Let's just say, in an illustration, that uh, your dad was, had all the resources that were needed, not just for him, but for a lot of other people. Now, obviously, I've got my younger son in the audience in this service. Uh, I'm not talking about myself, but we're just going to make a parallel to that of God for a moment. Let's say your dad's like super rich, and he comes to you one day, and he says to you, hey, I don't want you to be in debt any longer, and I have made provision for all of your debt to be paid for. In fact, I will make it so that you will never, ever have to be in debt again. It's in my safe. And let's say your dad tells you that that safe 
where all those resources are locked away is a biometric safe, which means it requires his touch to get in. And he goes over to the safe and he opens the safe with his touch, turns the big handle and opens that door. And sure enough, all the resources are right there. And he says, you can have it. It's yours. He steps aside. Now, two things are happening there. Number one, your dad is offering you resources that are not your own, but he's making them your own. He's giving them to you. But he is requiring an action on your part to step in faith and go get it. That's what this verse is talking about. He's saying to us that God in heaven has all the provision of righteousness. It's already there for you. All the debt of your sin can be paid for, and he will ensure that there will never, ever have to be a debt of sin in your life. The provision is available. It's already there. But he is calling you to step in faith and receive it. He's not going to press it upon you. He's not going to go deposit it in your account without your agreement. He's making the provision, and he says to you, come and get it. Come in faith and receive it. Come in faith and receive it unto your life and live your life out in that. So when he says, we are new creations in Christ, the old has passed away, the new has come, it's as if he has opened the door of salvation and righteousness and forgiveness of sin, and he says, come, receive it in faith. See, he works within his provision and your free will. He says to you in your choice, you can have this. I'm not going to force it. It's not universal. It's, it's not just going to be applied to everybody. It's available to everybody, but you're going to have to step in faith and receive it. So the new has come, and the effect of that newness is yours to be applied every day of your life. And in that, you can have freedom from sin. It's a glorious truth that God has given to us. Now, when the Bible says the old has passed away and the new has come, it's stating to us that God has provided for the sin debt and giving us every provision necessary for us to live righteously and free from sin from that day forward. The resource is ours. That doesn't mean that you won't struggle with sin. The Bible's pretty clear about that as well. In, in James chapter 3, it says we all stumble in many ways. In Romans chapter 6, it tells us the reason why we struggle with sin. It's because of the flesh that we live within. Uh, we all have those offenses that are against God. Things that are against his word, his will, his way. Those things that are rebellious towards him that we choose to do. Everybody has that in your life. And there are those things that you may not even choose to do, but because God is so holy and we are not, there are some things that we just don't do that are sin as well. Every one of us deal with that because we have this flesh. And at, at times we even take those sins and the rebelliousness that we have and we do them repetitively. We do them habitually. And those sins are very difficult to walk away from. If it were not for the victory that is ours in Christ and the provision of God to apply His grace in our life to overcome those things, it wouldn't happen. Those besetting sins are very, very uh, difficult to walk away from. So we're grateful that God gives us the power to do that. So let's talk about that provision and what God has given to us. Clearly, he has opened the door for us in his love and his grace to provide provision for this. And he, he gives us that opportunity. Romans 6 reveals that. So I want to walk you through some of those points out of Romans 6, uh, beginning in verse 11 there. Thinking about God's provision and our freedom over sin. Go back to verse 11. He says, so you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Now, just pause with me for a moment on this idea of consider for yourself. He's saying, make a mental note there. Now, that phrase is actually one word in the Bible in its original form, and it's a very important word. It's one that 
is really essential for Romans. As you understand the book of Romans, this word is important to know. It's the same word where we talk about the imputed sin or imputed righteousness. It's the same word. It would be like me saying, uh, I'm going to deposit something into your account. Or it might be a deposit or it might be I'm going to debit your account. It's something that's, that's put there. So it's the same word for consider. Take a mental note about this. And I think the the essence of this in the context of the whole book is this if you're going to have victory over sin you're going to have to give considerable thought to this imputing this putting of sin upon jesus on the cross and him dying with it and jesus putting his righteousness into your account and you living with it he's saying you're going to have to give that great consideration a mental note must be made at all the times of our living if we're going to have victory over sin and i think that's a great point for us because the enemy will tell you that you're not going to be able to overcome this the enemy will tell you that's just the way you are the enemy will say you cannot have victory over this but you and i are settling into this truth that the victory is ours. I need to concentrate on that and meditate on that and bring it back up regularly. It's a big deal when we say this, that we're dead in, in sin and alive in Christ. That's what he wants us to contemplate, to just think about. I'm dead to sin and alive to Christ. In fact, by the end of your time with me today, before the noon hour, I want that to resonate in us that we are dead to sin and alive to Christ. I'm dead to sin and alive to Christ. Say it out loud. I'm dead to sin and alive. Say it again. Yeah, when God says consider that, he wants that to go deep. He wants you to think of that regularly. Because when the temptation comes... He wants that to stir out of you, but I'm dead to sin and alive to Christ. When you're walking as a saint, he wants it stirred in you, not in arrogance, not in piety, but I'm dead to sin and alive to Christ. He wants that to resonate in us, and in that, it's the beginning. It's like the laying the foundation for our victory over sin. When we recognize we're new in Christ, we're a new creation in Christ, the effect of that is continual, and this settled truth is, is in me that I am dead to sin and alive to Christ. So when God sees our faith in Christ Jesus, and here's what he does. He takes the sin of our life and he puts it on his son and his son dies with it and he puts the righteous way of the living of the son and he puts it upon us and declares it over us. So when, when we say I'm dead to sin and alive to Christ, that's what we're communicating. We're communicating that Christ took our sin upon himself and he gave to us his righteous way of living. So I'm dead to sin and alive to Christ. The same power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the grave has been given to us to have victory over sin. Listen, the power that took the grip of death off of Jesus and resurrected him is the power that takes sin's grip off of us and releases us to live righteously. Glory be to God to that. This isn't about me and you cleaning up our life and sort of getting it better from this point forward, but it's settling into the truth that the victory of the resurrection has been treasured to me and that I am now dead to sin. Christ Jesus shared the death with me on the cross and I'm alive to Christ having shared the resurrection with him. And I do not have to live like I used to live. I'm a new creation. That's the truth that we ought to let settle in every idea and every faculty of our brain. So when you rise in the morning and when you lie down and every moment in between, it ought to be just constantly resonating in us that we're dead to sin and alive to Christ. And when you're living as a sinner or living as a saint, you repeat, I'm dead to sin and I'm alive to Christ. Some might argue, Randy, the sin is too fixed in my life. 
it is too set it is unchangeable i cannot break the patterns listen if i believed that that were true i would close this book i would call jesus a farce and i'd close the doors of this church because we're wasting our time but i want you to know that that is not true that you can be changed by the power of jesus christ and i know it's true because i stand before you as a man who is dead to sin and alive to christ i stand before you as a man who has been resurrected unto righteousness with power as i look out to you i see people who have been transformed as well some of you radically some of you were once selfish and are now selfless some of you were greedy and now you're amazingly generous some of you were steeped in sin and now you have aroma of righteousness how wondrous is God's great truth to us. Some of you are lust-filled men and women, but now are joyfully pure and right before God and others. I've witnessed the lives of many people who have been transformed by the power of Jesus Christ, and I'm witnessing the transformation. Listen, some of you are just beginning in your movement of faith you may have been coming to church for a long time but some of you are just beginning in a movement of faith to understand the power that is available to you in jesus christ manifest there on the cross and through the resurrection and now given to you some of you are just now beginning to experience what it's like to be alive to god with the spirit of god settled into you living in you and you coming to a daily conclusion that i my body doesn't belong to me i belong to christ the temple of god is now my body some of you are just now getting that and i say go for it go all the way and see the glory that god will give to you so let's consider this this morning by choosing three ways to respond to this passage you'll notice in the handout that the uh, the passage is there in some these three points that i'm making let me just review the verses 12 and 13 where we'll settle in for the next 10 minutes or so he says let not sin therefore reign it could be a word rule have authority over let not sin therefore rule over your mortal body to make you obey its passions do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness but present yourself to god as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to god as instruments for righteousness now the bible is one to deal with our sin first when we sin the bible deals with okay what do you do now grateful that god says in first john that if we confess our sin god is faithful and god is just and he'll cleanse us from unrighteousness so that's what we do when we find sin in our life but how do how do we keep sin from engaging us how do how do we keep that from occurring in our lives well the bible helps us to discover that as well and that's what this passage is doing so you notice in this first point uh, we ought to be intentional to not let the sin desires of our body rule us reign over us or have authority on us just we ought to be on guard to that the sin which dwells within our flesh wants to rule over us and and here's what he's saying uh, in this idea of reigning don't let your body with its sinful impulses its cravings and its desires don't let your body rule over you in that way i wish i could tell you that i was sinless i'm not yet one day i will be and if your faith is in jesus christ one day you will be as well now let me just frame that for you one day this old ticker is going to stop ticking and you i hope it's only a few of you left are going to put me in the ground <laughs> i hope i last a long time the lord gives me many years to serve him but you're going to put me in the ground and you're going to say old gunner's dead I hope you say he was really old, Gunner is dead. <laughs> oh, Gunner's dead. Like, no, no, no. Oh, Gunner's alive. Because I'm alive in Christ. Okay, this body's like a tent. It's just a temporary dwelling place for my spirit. But when this ticker stops, I will become absent from this body and I will be present with my Lord. You'll put my body in the ground 
and you'll cover it up and it will go right back to to dust but one day in the perfect time of the father jesus is going to call that body forth and when he calls it forth it won't be dirt it will be made glorious and when i see him i will have his glory as he has glory and in that body there will not even be a hint of sin there will not even be a longing for sin it will be completely a righteous and holy body that day is coming but it's not yet so i still live with the body that i was born in a body that was born in sin and i will die with a body still steeped in sin i was born in sin i'm going to die in sin but I will be resurrected incorruptible. That's the, that's the beauty of the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15 says that that's exactly what's going to happen for those who are in faith. So, but until that time, my body craves sin. My, my body has a desire to be opposed to the things of God. And here's what God says, Randy, do not let your body sin rule over you. Don't let something that is temporary like your body rule over something that is eternal like your spirit. Don't do that. That wouldn't be very smart. So I have to make a determination not to let my body or the sin of my body to rule over me. And so he's challenging us in that. So one of the things that Kay and I uh, have embraced with 40 Days of Renewal is a disciplining of our bodies. It's really what the Daniel Fast is all about for us. It's an engaging discipline of our body. Can I just tell you, the cravings are real. How about you? You're experiencing that? When you tell your body you are going to be restricted, your body wants to bring up every reason why you ought to have that. Have you noticed that? That's the way sin is. All right, the body hates restriction and discipline. The spirit loves it. So I want, during this time, for Kay and me to make choices, individually and collectively as a couple, ways that discipline our body. So we've said, okay, we're not going to participate in this. It's, it's not only unhealthy for us, but we want to force our body to be disciplined by our spirit. We do not want to have the body to win over always who we are, that we have to be given to cra cravings and given to desires. I, I want that to be part of it. We're not watching television right now. And sure, there are many times that I'm thinking, wonder what's on right now. Uh, I wonder what the score is, or I wonder what is going on here or there or the constant news feeds. We're not engaging in that. And of course, we're wanting that, but we are disciplining our bodies. And you say, what, are you trying to put yourself on, on a pedestal? Absolutely not. I'm trying to tell you the opposite. We have great needs to be disciplined. Our body wants to take over. Our body wants to rule our spirit. But God has given us a new life in spirit, and he says, let the new life of the spirit rule over your body. And you're going to have to be very persistent about that and engage in that. I would encourage you to apply that in some way. So you may not want to follow the Daniel fast. Apply discipline in your life. You don't like to make up the bed? Get up and make up the bed because your body needs to be ruled by your spirit, not your spirit over your body. There, there's an akin of physical discipline to spiritual disciplines. You can't deny that. It, they go together. So I would encourage us to force our bodies to do what our spirit believes is the inclinations of god and and exercise in that way we're very sensitive during this time and the, the purpose of that is not just that we we would be disciplined but listen we want our household to be more joy filled we want our lives to be lives of peace and we find that when our body is subjected to the spirit who is ruled by the holy spirit that we live with more joy and peace. We have greater power in prayer when we are engaged at this level. We have more of a heart of worship when we're engaged in this way. 
And so this is a good practice for us, and it's one that ought to be throughout our days of the year, that we would not let our body of sin rule over us. Secondly is this, be determined not to use any part of your body for the purpose of sin. And I've given some some expressions of that. Don't use any part of your body like your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your tongue, your hands, your feet, or any part that's clothed. Don't use that for the purpose of sin. He says in verse 13, the beginning, don't present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. So, you know, it's, it's not just that don't do it because it's not right, but don't do it because it develops a pattern in you. Have you ever noticed that, um, let's say you have uh, some frustration that's built up in you or uh, some, some required uh, bodily sense to express something that's negative. Uh, let's say you want to vent that frustration and it comes out with a rant or you want to vent that frustration, it comes out as cussing or gossip, backbiting or whatever it is. What the Bible is saying here is don't use your mouth to sin don't let your mouth engage in that practice of unrighteousness and it's not just the moment of the sin but the more you vent and the more you cuss and the more you gossip the more your heart is going to be affected by that now listen it doesn't wound your mouth for you to be cussing it doesn't wound your mouth for you to be gossiping it doesn't wound your mouth for you to vent out a whole bunch of of frustration but it wounds your heart And he says, don't use the instrument of your body in that way. Or some of you have a real besetted sin viewing pornography. He would say, don't use your eyes as instruments of unrighteousness because your eyes really are not affected by watching pornography. Your eyes are affecting your heart. So he says, don't use your body as an instrument for unrighteousness in that way. It's not just the sin in and of itself, but it's the perpetuation of that sin. It's a continuation of it. So the more you see, the more you're going to engage your heart in that. The more you vent, the more your heart's going to be engaged in that. The more you do those things with your hands, the more your heart's going to be engaged in that. Stop using your body as instruments for unrighteousness. It just begets more unrighteousness. So we have two intentionalities. And the first one is, is that we are determined to not let our body of sin to rule over us. And the second is we're determined not to use any part of our body for the unrighteousness. The Bible says clearly that there is a war that's going on between the body and the spirit. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. The desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to one another. That means that these are at war with each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. So the body is in opposition to the Spirit's work within you. Make the body uh, subjected to your Spirit and the Holy Spirit. Then number three, be purposeful to give yourself to God and use your body as an instrument for righteousness, for His glory. So it's not just don't do this, but it's do this. Um, and I think that's an, an interesting play there. Present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Uh, if you looked at the totality of that verse in verse 13, you'll see that there's two times that God is mentioning the word present here. And that always catches my attention where there's a repetitiveness to a verse and I usually circle those words and ask the Holy Spirit to give me understanding to why he's saying something twice. And in this case, it's really unique because there's a shift in the tenses of the verb. So you have the same word, but the verb usage of it is different. The first part implies that continual action that I mentioned earlier. It's in the present tense, which means the action continues. So it's the the idea of don't keep using your body parts for sin don't keep doing that regularly don't allow the habit to be built up and if the habit is built up force yourself by the power of jesus christ to stop that put put the pause in it hey did you know that in every temptation even if the temptation is regular in your life and the sin is habitual in your life did you know that in every temptation god steps in and gives you a way of escape 
Did you know that? If you'll just slow it down enough, you'll be more sensitive to the escape that God has given to you. So here's the tense change. The first one is a continual action. Just don't, don't allow your body to be used in this way for sin. And the second present is present your body parts as an instrument of righteousness. That is a point in time. That's, the verb tense is different there. It's an aorist tense, which means it's a point when you do that. So here's what I'm saying to us today by the authority of the God's word here. It's as if God is saying it directly to us recognize that you are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Let that constantly be on the forefront of your thinking. Make a determination to not allow sin to rule over you, not to use the parts of your body and continue to use the parts of your body for sin in unrighteous ways against God. But make the determination right now that for the rest of your days, your body parts are going to be used as instruments of righteousness for the glory of God. See how that goes? You can't do anything about yesterday. I wish you could change yesterday. Shoot, there's some stuff about my life yesterday I wish I could change. I can't change yesterday, but today... I can determine that my body will be an instrument of righteousness. My mouth will, my eyes will, my hands, my feet, my ears. Every part of my body can be a tool of righteousness in the master's hands. And when you place your body in the hands of the master, amazing things happen. Glorious things happen that impact all of eternity. Not just for people around you, but for you too that God will be glorified and he will allow that glory to be blessed throughout the days of eternity because you made a determination today that this is what I'm deciding, that my hands made by God are going to be used for his instruments of righteousness, that my ears are going to hear that which is of righteousness, that my eyes will not see that which is unrighteousness. I will not allow my body to rule over me in that way, but instead I choose to see what is holy and right and pure. And even when I'm seeing what is sinful, around me help me to see God through eyes of righteousness that I might know what's going on in the heart of that person that I might know what's going on in the heart of the Jesus to change that person God use my parts of my body for glory for good are you with me there I pray that that would happen so here's the Lord he's touched and opened the resources through his son Jesus and he's offering it to every one of us to have victory over sin. And he says, exercise your free will, stepping in faith, and take the resource. Take it. Stop trying to do this on your own as if religion is going to help you. Come to my son and take the resources. He'll forgive you of your sin debt. And he'll make it so that you would never, ever have to be in debt again. It's a little prayer that I came across this week, so simple that it was profound. And I jotted it down. It's on the screens. God, here I am, alive from the dead. I've died with Christ and I've been resurrected with Christ. Praise your name. Now, here's my body, my arms, my voice, my eyes, every part. Take them all that they might be instruments of righteousness and not of sin. I like that. So much so that I prayed that. And I would encourage you to do the same thing. Would you bow your head with me? Just in closing your eyes, we'll just have a moment of prayer. Believing that it's God's desire for each of us to be set free from sin. Certainly he has guaranteed that those who are in faith in him will be sinless in heaven one day, but God says that he's given us the measure by which we can sin less today. He places his Holy Spirit in us and empowers us with self-discipline. That's part of the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. And now he has made the provision for our sin debt to be paid and made the provision available to us that we would never be indebted again. So if your prayer, the prayer of your heart is that which I have already read to you, 
then I want to ask you to pray it along with me. I'll say a phrase, and if it is inclined in your heart to pray that phrase, then you just pray it. I pray often just aloud. And so I'll ask all over the house today that as we pray, we just repeat these words in a prayer aloud. Let's pray it together. God, here I am. Go ahead. Alive from the dead. I've died with Christ. And I have been resurrected with Christ. Praise your name. And now here's my body. My arms, my voice. My eyes, every part. Take them all, that they might be instruments of righteousness and not sin. Oh, Father, I thank you for the measure that you have given to us in Christ to be proclaimed righteous. I'm thankful for the faith that has stirred in us as a gift from you to live in that truth. Maybe there's some in this room that you are drawing to that conclusion that Jesus is the only way and that his death on the cross pays the significant price that is due for sin. And his righteous living is shared to us by giving us new life through the resurrection and the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. I pray if this is the day that you are bringing people to yourself in salvation, that that faith would be applied and that they would respond to you, yield their, themselves to you, reject all others and follow you, deny themselves in their way and follow you and your way alone. And I pray for the many in this room who have surrendered their lives to Christ and the evidence of that now is in a decision to not be ruled over by sin or the body of sin, to not allow the parts of their body to be used for unrighteousness any longer, but are making a steadfast determination right now, Lord, that their bodies, our bodies, would be used for you in righteousness. Help us, God, with your provision. Help us to have the great determination and the great significant grace to carry it through in the power of Jesus. We recognize without him, Lord, we could do nothing. But in him, all things are possible. Empowered to have great victory, to be overcomers. So we pray that the evidence of that would be found in our choices and in our actions. To the glory of Jesus. And in his name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a song that's familiar to those of us at Meadowbrook. It's about clean hands and a pure heart that God can give. As we sing that song, it'll be our final song together. I invite you to come forward if you're here today to trust Jesus as your Savior. I'll have some people standing down front to pray with you and encourage you as you're making those kind of decisions. There might be others who just want to come alongside and pray. We would say these steps to the platform are a great place to do that. Just you and God. You come as God might be leading you or calling you. It might be that you say, you know what? My life needs to be transformed by Christ. I've been walking in my own way. I know him, but I've not been surrendered to him. Today, I dedicate myself to him. You come as God is leading you to come. Be encouraged together. Let's sing. to be used for unrighteousness. From evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. 
Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, who seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob, oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, who seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob, we bow our hearts, we bend our knees, oh Spirit, come make us clean hands give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another give us clean hands give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another oh God let us be a generation that seeks, who seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. O oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, who seeks your face, O oh God of Jacob. Anybody ever prayed the prayer, oh God, I just blew it? I've prayed that many times. And the Lord answers that prayer. He responds with grace, love, faith, 